Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I would like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask everyone to be respectful of each other and not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you could be escorted out. Um, also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Coletta, Councilor Durkin, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan. Here. Councilor Mejia. Here. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. This week's clergy, I would like to ask my council colleague, City Councilor Sharon Durkin, to please come forward and introduce our clergy for this afternoon's meeting. Councilor Durkin. Thank you so much, Council President Flynn. I'd like to welcome Father Joe White from St. Joseph's Parish in the West End uh, to jo in joining us. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Father Joe White has over 30 years of ministry to our city and to the people of Boston. He's been a servant to the West End community at St. Joseph's Parish for a very long time. He has a huge heart for our friends who struggle with addiction. And he's a great example of a good neighbor who seeks justice, loves mercy, and walks humbly with God. Thank you so much, uh, Father Joe, for everything you bring to our city. And um, it's been lovely to work with you. I know during the pandemic, you did so much to make sure that the needs were met of our community members who, um, who didn't have enough to eat. And so I'm really grateful for everything you did and um, grateful to share a faith tradition with you and see you as a mentor and someone that, um, that I lean on for advice and support. So um, if you could come up here and, and, and lead us in prayer today, um, for our last council meeting, it would uh, be an honor to pray with you. Thank you, Councilor Durkin, and as we come together and ask blessing, it's good to be with new councilor and to also be able to be with those of you who this is your last uh, session in chamber and bring together who I've known for years. I'm going to ask us if we could all respond. Lead us, guide us, give us wisdom. Lead us, guide us, give us wisdom. As we join our prayers together today, our world is troubled. Our world is very troubled. We join together and recognize as individuals and as varieties of people, we turn to our Creator, our God. We pray, Lord, Allah, Adonai, God beyond all names, God of all names. We are more and more polarized. We pray, God, in this time, as individuals and as community, varied and specific, cultural, spiritual, ethnicity, nationality, color, religions, with seasonal celebrations, call us collectively to let shine through any darkness. Let us be people of the light. We pray for new counselors. We pray for continuing counselors. We pray for counselors completing their service to this city. Counselor Flaherty, Counselor Baker, Councilor Royal, Councilor Aro. For those beginning, we pray together. If you would, repeat after me. 
Lead us, guide us, give us wisdom. Lead us, guide us, give us wisdom. Our world is troubled, a weary world. But we recognize yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Be counselors of the light for constituents in the dark. Be former counselors of the light for people you will continue to encounter. We pray, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, guide us, our city, be with us, Lord Adonai, Allah, God of and beyond all names. Brighten us with responses of peace and justice. Call us from faith to works. And we, the people, say, Amen, Amen, Amen. 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 Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much, Father Joe. Could, you, could everyone please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, can you ensure the record is reflected that Council Lara is present, Council Baker is, is present, Council Royal is present? Yeah. Thank you, Father Joe White, for being with us for those words and bringing us together. And also, Father, thank you for always being there for those troubled in society, including people with significant medical and mental health challenges. Your guidance and leadership has supported so many people in need, so thank you. Thank you, Father Joe. At this time, I would like to ask City Councilor Frank Baker to please come forward. We do have a special presentation this afternoon. Council Baker. Good morning, everybody. Um, today we're here to, are we honoring you, Steve? What are we doing here today? We're gonna, we're gonna honor Steve. We're, another, another person that has um, done great work, yeoman's work in, this, in the city for 27 years. Steve's been a friend um, to many people in this room. He, he, he and his family have been amazing to work with in Dorchester, the Port Norfolk. His, his dad was legendary, Ben and was also good friends of my father. Um, they were special people. Steve Tank will be retiring on January 5th after 27 years of service to the city of Boston. Steve has played many roles throughout his tenure. Uh, he was a director of code enforcement with Department of Public Works where he worked directly with constituents and oftentimes our offices to help maintain the quality of life in their communities. In most, in most recent years, we all know the important role he played within the Municipal Police Office and Property Management Department. His role is to protect city property and always went above and beyond, even injuring himself at times. <laughs> Steve was a recipient of the 2015 Henry L. Shattuck Public Service Award for his commitment to the citizens of Boston. And Steve and his wife, Carla, who we also know quite well, Carla, um, live in Port Norfolk in District 3. He has five children. Pamela, Ben, Will, Ilana, Alana, and Ava. He's also grandfather of four and one on the way. With that, I wish you all the best in your retirement, Steve, and I thank you for your friendship, 
for all your work you've done in, in our community in Dorchester and all, and all the support you've shown me and our district in this council through your years, your 27 years. Congratulations, Steve. Thank you. Please say And he told me, I saw him coming in today, he told me he was leaving for the day. For the day. I want to thank uh, Mayor Wu and the previous mayors but more importantly, I want to thank everybody that mentored me throughout the years. Uh, I have always looked at this job as a way to help the citizens of Boston. I've lived here all my life. I plan on staying here the rest of my life. And uh, I just try to do the right thing. That's all I ask of other people, and that's all is asked of me. I'm not going to get into a big dialogue, but there's too many people to thank individually. But those of you that have my cell phone number, and people question that often when I gave them my cell phone number because it wasn't a city cell phone number. It was my personal cell phone number. And for those of you that have it, I want to thank you for being there for me, and I hope I was there for you. Thank you. Could, could my city council colleagues please join us for a photo with Steve and his wonderful family? Yeah. Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Collar, and to Steve's family and Collar's family for being here, for your dedication to the residents of Boston for so many years. Honored to work with you, Steve. Mr. Clerk, could you please ensure the record is reflected? Council Braden is present. Council Wuerl is present. Council Cotta is present. We are having a we are obviously having four colleagues that are departing. And this would be their last meeting. Councillor Royo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Lara, and Councillor Flaherty. And at this time, it's an honor to have the mayor of the city in the council chamber, former city councillor. But it's an honor to have the mayor here. I want to invite Mayor Wu here and acknowledge our departing um, city councillors and um, for their work and commitment to the residents of Boston. Mayor Wu. Good morning, everyone, and um, congratulations on a, a wonderful year and a, a great term. Um, I know this is the last meeting and therefore the agenda is very packed, so I wanted just to take as little time as possible, but I did want to stop by and um, give my gratitude and appreciation to all of you for the work that you've been doing on behalf of our shared constituents and residents, uh, and especially to just give a special, special thank you to those whose service on the council may be coming to an end, uh, but we're not going to say goodbye because we know each of you is going to to continue to stay very involved in the business and the, the well-being and the livelihood of our city uh, and all of our community members because that's what got you here in the first place and, and we definitely won't let you go in terms of um, what we expect of contributions and leadership that, that will continue. Um, <clears throat> so for the four departing colleagues, I wanted to bring by a Revere Bowl um, that's engraved with your name just to recognize your service to the residents of Boston. Um, it's just something very small from our administration, just to say thank you um, to you and to your families. I know it, uh, 
isn't an easy time ever maybe to be in the public eye, but especially lately just in the environment that we all are in today uh, from the national level on down, it, it is a sacrifice uh, and it comes with the greatest joys and rewards of, of doing this meaningful work, but for your family members, for you, for the, the time, the heart, the emotion that can go into it, um, we want to recognize all that you have put in and invested into our city and into the city council. Um, so just wanted to present these uh, to uh, on behalf of everyone for the work that has been publicly documented and each of you has led the way on important conversations for the city, important successes and victories, um, but especially for those that have not been ever publicly celebrated. Uh, and with each of you, I have just a little sense of how much you put in when the cameras aren't there, when people don't know, and it's in the one-on-one -on -one conversations where people have nowhere else to go, or the moments where um, had you not been where you are, had you not been where in that space or at that decision-making table, um, people would not have had that attention, the results, uh, and we thank you most of all for all that you personally contributed in that way. And to everyone else, uh, just to say thank you for the year, uh, I'm gonna leave these in, in your offices, but um, for all the counselors, these are just a little bit of green and, and red for the season from Cedar Grove Gardens, uh, and just as a thank you and happy holidays, and um, wonderful to be with you all always. Yeah. Could I, could I ask um, my four departing city councilors to please come forward, but also I would like to ask all colleagues to come for a, for a group photo. And also, if we could do a group photo with the mayor. Yeah, one of you guys. Thank you, Mayor Wu, for being with us this afternoon. I would also like to acknowledge several city, former city councilors that are here with us this afternoon as well. City Councilor Anissa Asabi George, thank you, Councilor. City Councilors Felix Arroyo and Felix Arroyo Jr. as well. Um, Councilor Arroyo. Council of Royal, Council of Asabi, George, thank you for being with us. A friend of mine retired from the Boston Police Department, a friend of mine in Council Flaherty last year. He's also in the audience. I want to acknowledge him and recognize him for his commitment to the residents of the city 
Joe Lehman from Charlestown. Joe, thank you for being here. He lives in Southie now, but I always say to him, once a townie, always a townie. Hmm. We're on to the first order of business, approval of the minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion. On the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor the mayor. Mr. Kirk, can we go on to docket 1819, please? Docket number 1819, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $816,000 in the form of a grant from the Electric Blue Bikes Adoption Grant awarded by the United States Department of Transportation, passed through the Boston region Metropolitan Planning Organization to be administered by the Policy and Planning Division in the Boston Transportation Department. The grant will fund the introduction of electric assist bikes, e-bikes, into the City of Boston's publicly owned and managed blue bike share system. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Um, Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Um, but blue bikes, I want that to remain Okay. This talk at 1819 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1820? Docket number 1820, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $200,000 in the form of a grant for the BHCCI Connect, Learn, and Explore grant awarded by Boston Children's Hospital to be administered by the Office of Early Childhood. The grant will fund the Boston Healthy Child Care Initiative and the Office of Early Childhood's Connect, Learn, and Explore initiative. Thank you. This talk at 1820. 1820 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, Communities. Mr. Clerk, can you read the dock? It's 1821. 1822. Docket number 1821, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $30,000 in the form of a grant for the Mayor's Civic Summit awarded by the donor group to be administered by the Office of Civic Organizing. The grant will fund the support costs of the Mayor's inaugural Civic Summit. Docket number 1822, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an in-kind donation of food and event space valued at $20,000 donated by Boston University. The purpose of this donation is to support the inaugural Mayor Civic Summit, which will occur on Saturday, January 13, 2024, at Boston University. The Mayor Civic Su Summit will train and connect 200 Boston residents across neighborhoods in skill-based workshops, panels, and networking activities focused on leadership, fundraising, and communication, among other topics. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Orell, the Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Orell, you have the floor. Uh, I'd like to stay in committee. <laughs> yeah. We're in a short recess. Mention of the rules and passage of this docket, 1821. Before I go to the vote, Councilor Durkin, you have recognized? I just wanted to thank BU uh, personally for everything they do for the community, including hosting this summit, which I think is a great community benefit, and I'm really happy that they're doing this. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Council Dorkin. Council Worrell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this docket, 1821. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Worrell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the next docket, 1822. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Thank you, Council Worrell. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clark, please read docket 1823. Docket number 1823. Communication was received from Maureen Joyce, City Auditor, transmitting reports listing transfers made solely for the purpose of closing accounts for fiscal year 2023. Thank you. This docket 1823 will be placed on file. Reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0137. Docket number 0137, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on January 11th, 2023. Docket number 0137, Ordinance Establishing Protections for the City of Boston Tree Canopy, submits a report recommending that the ordinance ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Royal, the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Docket 0137 is an ordinance establishing protections for the City of Boston Tree Canopy, uh, sort of publicly known as the uh, Tree Ordinance Protection Act, uh, which was referred to the Committee on Government Operations on January 11th uh, and was filed by myself and co-sponsored by Councilors Braden and Councilor Lara. Uh, the original intent of this ordinance was to protect both public and private property trees. Uh, and throughout the course of the year of sort of working on this back and forth with the administration, uh, it became very obvious that this should be split into two separate ordinances, one for public property trees, uh, otherwise known as, and I'm just gonna do the whole list, trees that are on Boston Water and Sewer Commission property, Boston Housing Authority property, Boston Public Schools property, uh, or the BRA doing business as the Boston Planning Development Agency, and all trees on the grounds of other city buildings, um, as well as public street trees uh, in its own category. Uh, this is a first of its kind for the city of Boston ordinance, which is why it took uh, the amount of time and gestation that it took. We had a, uh, under uh, the previous administrations, there were uh, audits of our public trees, uh, a urban forestry plan, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that this coincided with that work so that we were working uh, to enhance that work, not uh, at cross purposes uh, or creating more work. Uh, and so there were a number of working sessions with advocates and city officials on this ordinance. Uh, and so I'll just go through some of the things that this does. Uh, the amended docket removes definitions uh, for replacement caliper and significant tree and instead introduces definitions for certified arborist, uh, city property tree and critical root zones. Definitions for caliper remove, uh, removal and capital improvement projects have been slightly modified uh, in this version uh, than what was initially uh, filed. The tree warden section has been amended to reflect that the tree warden is under the direction of the Boston Parks and Recreation Department and designated by the Parks Commissioner. Uh, the tree warden's qualifications, duties, and responsibilities and authority are also amended in this draft. Uh, in this docket, the tree warden is in charge of public shade trees and given the authority to remove a tree under certain circumstances. Uh, in this amended draft, the tree warden's responsibilities include posting notices and holding public hearings as needed for the removal of city property trees. The tree warden will also have the authority to permit the removal or partial removal of trees that are dead, deceased, or dying, posing a risk to persons in their property, trees that are invasive species, or for the suppression of pests. The tree warden will be required to maintain and publish quarterly reports of all tree removal applications received and granted within 30 calendar days after the end of each calendar, month, uh, calendar quarter and calendar year. Uh, a section on the Boston Parks and Recreation Department Commissioner has been added, uh, explaining that he or she shall have the authority over all trees, plants, and, and shrubs belonging to the city, and has the discretion uh, to issue regulations and policies relevant to Mass General Laws Chapter 87. The amended docket removes a section on Senior Urban Forestry and Landscape Planner, and a section on Urban Forestry Committee, and replaces it with a section on an Urban Forestry Advisory Committee that would be convened by the Parks Commissioner. Uh, this seven-member committee shall be comprised of residents from historically marginalized communities uh, and uh, areas of the city that have the uh, lowest amount of, of tree canopy. Uh, this amended docket now includes the following sections, uh, protection of public shade trees, a protection of property, uh, city property trees, work affected critical root zones, uh, policies and regulations and severability. Uh, the protection of public shade trees section imposes a requirement that written approval be obtained for the removal. Uh, from the tree warden, approval by the tree warden will be based on tree health and size, current growing conditions, proposed growing conditions of replacement trees, viability of tree survival, and public input. Uh, and this section is now required that public shade tree replacements approved by the tree warden be planted at or near the location uh, that a tree was removed. Replacements shall be maintained for at least two years or longer. 
depending on uh, best management practices determined by the tree warden. Uh, in regards to the protection of city property trees, a section has been added which requires a notification and opportunity for public comment at a public meeting or hearing. Once a notice has been posted on or around that tree, uh, that is up for discussion. It also provides for abutters that live within 300 feet of where a tree is now located on public property uh, to appeal any decisions that are made ultimately by a tree warden within 30 days to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, all removal quest requests for city property trees measuring less than three inches to, in diameter, breast height, one foot from the ground. That sounds very technical because it is. Many of our meetings were about how many calipers around the tree, uh, what qualifies as a tree. Uh, and so this does a lot uh, to further define what trees are applicable and what trees are not. Um, I want to thank members of the administration, Chief Mariama Hammond White, uh, or Chief Mariama White Hammond, rather, Kat Eschel, uh, Chief of Staff to the Mayor's Office of Environment, Energy, and Open Space, Commissioner Ryan Woods, uh, Tree uh, Warden and City Arborist Max Board Diamond, uh, for their assistance in amending this ordinance, and advocates as well from a number of organizations uh, for their input on the draft that's before you today. Uh, as chair of the city of uh, the committee on government operations, I move that this docket ought to pass in its amended draft. It would uh, bring Boston, uh, make us one of, uh, there's other communities that have put forward tree protection ordinances. It would make us one of sort of the pioneers on this space. Uh, it's a necessary step, I think, considering the direction that our natural, uh, national and local uh, environment, uh, the importance of environmental protections, I think, have been highlighted and accentuated due to the differing levels of climate crisis uh, that we are experiencing around the country and in the world, uh, and even here in Boston when it comes to heat zones. Um, so it is my sincerest hope that this passed today uh, unanimously, but uh, I want to thank and give an opportunity to uh, my co-sponsors if they'd like to speak, but I want to thank all the advocates uh, and the administration officials who made uh, honing this and getting this to a position where it was ready to get forward uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. I think Councilor Breda is the second sponsor. The, oh. the chair recognizes Council Braden. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank my co sponsors, uh, Councilor Royal and Councilor Lara, for bringing this forward and for the diligence. It has taken a long time. Uh, to get here and for the diligent work of our uh, partners in the, uh, in the city to try and get this um, across the line. Um, I don't, it goes without saying that our tree canopy and our urban uh, uh, forestry project is very, very critically important to the health of our neighbourhoods, especially those neighbourhoods that uh, are experiencing heat island effects um, and our um, in, uh, environmental justice communities across the city. Um, so I'm really delighted that we are here. Uh, I also think we have so much more work to do to educate our residents. Um, some folks view trees as a nuisance, uh, but we have a lot of work to do to educate our residents about the value of trees and how they greatly enhance our health and well-being and quality of life across the city. Um, and this is, where, this is one phase of the process, and I look forward to um, moving, f continuing this process in the next term to address the issues of trying to preserve our um, urban tree canopy on privately held land. Uh, that is where we're seeing the greatest loss of urban uh, of tree canopy, and uh, I, I, I think it's really a question of. Uh, engaging with the public, engaging with landowners about to really stress the value of our trees for our uh, long-term viability as a livable city. So thank you uh, everyone and I, I look forward to my colleagues supporting this and, uh, and they also commit to continuing the work to get this uh, uh, a more comprehensive uh, protection for trees across the city both on private and public land. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to the chair and my co-sponsors for working on, on this ordinance um, so diligently to ensure that uh, we had it in front of the council 
I am happy to have this be my last act as the chair of the Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks Committee here on the City Council and um, to, you know, no pun intended, speak, speak for the trees here uh, on the floor. In over a year, uh, acres of trees can absorb as much carbon as produced and can drive up to 8,700 miles. And trees that are cut down here um, really, trees cut down create noise pollution. Um, or better yet, help with noise pollution by acting as sound barriers. And one acre of tree removes up to 2.6 tons of carbon dioxide each year. And so I wanna say this because I, I don't think that the importance of trees is really lost um, on this council and the importance of protecting our tree canopy is not lost on the council. This ordinance is coming at a time where we're continuing to experience record high temperatures, particularly across the city, but in our most vulnerable neighborhoods. And this year alone, we've experienced a record high temperature of 61 degrees um, in February, which was breaking a record that stood in Boston since 1910. So as we begin and continue to right the wrongs that we've committed against our environment throughout history, I think that this ordinance is gonna act as a much needed step towards doing just that. And I hope that as a council body, we can stand together and take a vote on this today. I hope that future leaders use this legislation as a building block toward creating even okay. further environmental change and policy. And I hope that in the future, when the next generation asks how we fought against the global climate crisis, we can point to legislation like this and so much other work that we've been able to get done in the committee to show them that when time came, we stood in favor of our planet. So thank you again to Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Braden, and I hope that we can pass this ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of DACA 0137 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed in a new draft. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1701, 1704, 1705, 1749, and 1796 together. <clears throat> Docket number 1701, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,358,100 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 22 assistance to firefighters grant operation and safety, awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will fund the procurement of personal protective equipment, bailout systems, and the training required to use this PPE safely, as well as fund cancer and cardiac screening programs to provide early clinical detection of members. Docket number 1704, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $250,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 COPS accreditation project awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund accreditation process through the purchase of power DMS to document objective evidence of CLEA and MPAC requirements. Docket number 1705, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $47,890.47 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 22 fire prevention and safety grant programs awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will fund the purchase of an evidence management system and necessary reporting, supporting items, and provide one-time training to personnel of the Fire Investigation Unit on the use of the system. Docket number 1749. Message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $175,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 COP CD micro grant community policing development awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund building trust and legitimacy with community building. With COP's community development microfunding, the Boston Police Department will hire two full-time brick data analysts to work with the Bureau of Field Services and the 11 district captains and community service officers. The Bureau of Community Engagement to help connect with an even wider range of community partners. 
other bureaus will add data and information on the community CompStat meetings and the Office of Research and Development Civilian Hub Program Coordinator who operates six district hub table convening per week throughout the neighborhoods of Boston. Document number 1796, message and not authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $13,317,200 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 urban area security initiative awarded by the United States Department of Homeland Security, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. The grant will fund planning, exercise trainings, and operational needs that will help prevent, respond to, and recover from threats of acts of terrorism, including chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive incidents. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, the Chair recognizes Council of Flaherty on, on these dockets. Council Flaherty, do you want to speak on yes. all of them all together? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise as Chair of Public Safety, and uh, it's a pleasure to pull these five dockets. Uh, we held a hearing on uh, Monday, December 11th, uh, regarding these public safety grants. Uh, BFD will administer 1701 and 1705. BPD will administer 1704 and 1749. And the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management will administer 1796. Uh, these uh, grants combined will provide uh, funding to purchase equipment, provide training, hire positions, and to offer resources to improve the health uh, of employees while keeping our city safe. Uh, I'll take target 1704 first. Uh, it's a message in order for 250,000 uh, that will provide funding for accreditation to ensure the Boston Police Department is meeting standards of professionalism, ethics, accountability, and best practices while reducing liability risk. The purpose of the accreditation is to increase trust with the community through engagement, transparency, and accountability. These funds will be used for accreditation. Target 1749, that's $175,000 in form of a grant to the Fiscal 23 COP CD Micro Grant Community Policing Development Program. This funding will provide two data analysts uh, in order to elicit dialogue with community groups and nonprofits. BPD discussed the, di the difference between CompStat meetings and hub tables, explaining that the hub tables are designed to deal with acutely elevated risk individuals and families where social workers and caseworkers are brought in to develop comprehensive service plans. BPD explained that there are currently six hub tables. Uh, one at Melnia Cass and the remainder are district based and funding from this grant will help fulfill their mission of building trust and cooperation within communities as well as sharing important information. Target 1796, that's a $13,317,200 uh, grant for the Urban Area Security Initiative. Chief Benford uh, was here testifying in support. Uh, these funds will be used to prevent and respond to acts of terrorism and natural disasters also explain that the Urban Security Initiative will build regional capacity for security. Uh, and uh, it's not lost on us that obviously September 11th uh, was launched at Logan and that we had the marathon bombing and there's been a number of incidents uh, that we've been dealing with as a city uh, since then. So very much needed funding. Uh, he's saying that the targets uh, tend to, the target areas tend to expand, but funding tends to decrease. So these are much needed resources for him and his team to make sure that our city remains safe. Uh, docket 1705, message in order uh, to accept and expend $47,890.47 in the form of a grant for fire safety and, and the safety grant program for fire prevention. Uh, this will train system of personnel fire investigative unit. Funding will provide a clean temperature controlled room to maintain evidence that will provide uh, ability to show chain of custody in the instance of uh, an arson investigation. Uh, the system will provide a storage facility to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of tracking uh, evidence for fire investigators uh, to use uh, with in partnership with law enforcement in the district attorney's office and our local courthouses. And lastly, docket 1701, uh, very obviously special for me as chair of public safety to put forth a grant of uh, $1,358,100 in the form of assistance to fire by this grant operation. Uh, it's not lost to me that uh, my dad, when he served at the Beacon Hill, uh, went to great lengths uh, to make sure uh, he was addressing uh, occupational habits for firefighters very early on uh, with the heart and lung bill and the cancer bill and such. So uh, this grant uh, will, um, it's, this will provide a bailout. It's, it's two-prong. Two 
Does it bail out care system to develop methods of safely escaping of fires? If someone's trapped on a roof or they're trapped in a room, they will now have a new safety uh, belt, which is actually a rope, uh, which will extend 35 feet. Again, last ditch effort in the event that there's uh, uh, someone trapped uh, or um, conditions have worsened to the point where they need to find an escape route. Uh, so uh, that's a clearly a life safety measure that is part of uh, this grant. Uh, the other part of it is um, there's a significant number of uh, hazardous uh, job related uh, cancers. Uh, this will uh, provide additional cancer screenings uh, and emphasize early detection uh, because of the hazards of the job and the high rates of cancer diagnosis with firefighters. Particularly what we're now seeing is younger firefighters, firefighters now that are in their 30s and 40s are now being diagnosed. So this will go a long way in starting that screening earlier. Uh, give them the opportunity to, uh, if necessary, uh, if they have a diagnosis, to be able to, to jump on it uh, early on uh, in the process uh, in an effort to beat it. Uh, all these dockets uh, are essential to securing our city, whether it be terrorism, fostering a working relationship with BPD, or providing safety uh, and screening for our firefighters. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, just ask as Chair of Public Safety that uh, we move uh, to pass uh, 1701, 1704, 1705, 1749 and 1796. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. I do want to take a vote on this, um, but I, I will give Council Royal an opportunity to, to weigh in. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'll be voting yes on every docket uh, but 1749. Uh, I know we had, I think it was maybe a month ago, time flies. Uh, it might have been a month, two months ago. Uh, we pushed through four, four dockets of funding for the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, for data analysts, for their BRIC, uh, which is tied to uh, the gang database, which I do believe is uh, unconstitutional and, and really doesn't serve uh, the city. Uh, at that time, if I remember correctly, uh, the information that came back was that even without those grants, there were something like six possibly more uh, positions unfilled for the data analyst positions. And then we pushed through four separate grants of additional funding for more data positions. This creates even more data positions. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna be a no on docket 1749 and a yes on, I believe there's several more there. I'll be a yes on all of those minus 1749, but I did want to explain uh, that no vote when we get to that uh, docket number uh, in the roll call. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Council Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the Committee Report, passage of Docket 1701. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Don't you vote. Mr. Cora, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on Docket Number 1701. Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. <clears throat> Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Durkin? Yes. Councilor Durkin, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1701 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. I do want to continue with the voting, but I will give Councilor Louis Jean an opportunity to weigh in. Councilor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Sorry, Council President Flynn, I think I just missed the moment. It moved quicker than I thought, but I really appreciate you allowing me to speak. Just to uh, you know, echo what Councilor Arroyo said about docket number 1749, I also want to thank the administration, uh, Commissioner Cox, and uh, Chief Benford, who gave uh, us a lot, my office a lot of information in a short turnaround. Uh, uh, we, window, we got about 750 pages this morning of responsive materials that we need to go through. Still have the same concerns that we had the last time, and it warrants further discussion and dialogue regarding accountability and transparency. Um, we know that adding analysts to the brick who work in our neighborhoods requires more input and collaboration with community to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good in our black and in all of our communities, and especially in our black and brown communities. And I'll also be voting no on 1796, the $13.5 uh, million in funding for USIA funding. Uh, I know that the decision is not determined completely by the Office of Emergency Management, but rather by 
uh, JPOC, representatives from each of the nine cities and towns that constitute the Metro Boston Homeland Security Region. Uh, Boston as a lead city has significant influence on the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security and, so, uh, and how these grant applications develop. All this to say that we need more community conversation for both of these grants. Uh, I'll be voting no on these two, but excited to vote yes on 1701 to make sure that uh, folks have uh, everything they need. Well, we just voted. Um, and on some of the other grants that we'll get, uh, our public safety officers, uh, things they need. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just. Uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak. I am going to also be uh, uh, following alongside my colleagues who have spoken in regards to their opposition to some of the grants that we're going to be voting on. For me, I think that we have an opportunity to pause um, and create more uh, space for, I've gotten a lot of calls um, from uh, police officers of color really concerned about some of the opportunities for civilian flaggers and making sure that we have a system in place that ensures that the city of Boston residents are having opportunities and that officers of color are also having opportunities. So I think given the fact that there's still so many things to yet to be determined, I think that we have an opportunity to slow down the process and create space for community um, and, and folks who are doing the work to actually have uh, an opportunity to speak about what the process is going to look like moving forward. So I will, too, be voting no on the other docs. Thanks. Thank you, Council Mejia. <laughs> Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passive docket 1704. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. No, Mr. Kirk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll we'll call vote on docket number 1704. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1704 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This docket is passed. Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 1705. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The doc. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1705. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1705 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. This docket has passed. Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 1749. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1749. Council Arroyo? No. Council Arroyo, no. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? No. Council Lara, no. Council Lujan? No. Council Lujan, no. Council Mejia? No. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? No. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1749 has received seven votes in the affirmative and five votes in the negative. This docket has passed. Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report 
pass it to the docket 1796. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1796. Council Arroyo? No. Council Arroyo, no. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? No. Council Braden, no. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? No. Council Lara, no. Council Lujan? No. Council Lujan, no. Council Mejia? Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? No. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1796 has received six votes in the affirmative and six votes in the negative. Can we take a quick, a, a quick uh, recess, please? We're back in session. This docket has not passed. Mr. Clerk, would you please read docket 0160, please? Docket number 0160, order for a hearing regarding supplemental sidewalk clearance program during snowstorms in Boston. The chair recognizes Council Worrell, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, the City Council hearing on December 11th, held a hearing on December 11th, 2023 for the City Services and Innovation Technology Committee focused on docket number 0161 concerning the supplemental sidewalk program uh, during snowstorms in Boston. The initiative is sponsored by former Councilor Kenzie Bach and I aim to address issues related to sidewalk clearing during win winter months. My fellow council colleagues, Council President Flynn, Council Murphy, Council Coletta, and Council Dur Durkin were present for the hearing. The meeting discussed the pilot program success involving targeted snow removal in high traffic pedestrian areas uh, Superintendent Mike Bro and Assistant Superintendent Daniel Neal from Department of Public Works and representatives from 311 and Mayor's Commission's Office uh, for persons with disabilities were present. During the meeting, we emphasized, emphasized the need for coordinated efforts, sufficient funding, and consideration for uh, new street designs affecting snow removal services. Superintendent Bro highlighted the challenges faced by the DPW workforce and explained the targeted approach of the sidewalk program. The meeting also touched upon the need for collaboration with the Disabilities Commissions, 311, and other stakeholders throughout the winter seasons. Additionally, we also discussed that some opera funds have been allocated to the Streets Cabinet to expand the permanent snow removal program, particularly using specialized equipment like bobcats for commercial areas. The administration presentation highlighted the limitations of existing GPS systems and providing real-time information about infrastructure changes during snow removal operations. We touched on sidewalk accessibility, collaboration with main streets, and involving, involving the community in snow um, removal efforts. Um, the idea um, brought to Superintendent Brohl about dispensing some ice melt apparatus in our main street districts, similar to how we now have sunscreen dispensers at parks. It might allow residents and businesses to access it easier and help um, keep our sidewalk clear of ice, and that some, um, and that some things and that, that's something he's going to explore in 2024. Um, considering all this, I recommend that this hearing stay in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. This talk it will remain in committee. I'd also like to recognize former City Councilor Tito Jackson. Um, good to be with you, Council. I'd also like to recognize Larry Calderon from the Boston Police Patrolman Association. Larry, good to be with you. Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket 1578, 1579, 1812, 1813, please. Docket number 1578, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 24 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $145,545 to provide funding for the Boston Public Schools for fiscal year 24 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the Boston School Department Plant Administrators Association. 
filed in the Office of the City Clerk on October 16, 2023. Docket number 1579, message in order for a supplemental appropriation order for the Boston School Department for fiscal year 24 in the amount of $145,545 to cover the fiscal year 24 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the Boston School Department Plant Administrators Association. The terms of the contract are September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2026. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5% and 2% to be given in each be given in September of each fiscal year of the contract term. The agreement also includes increases to on-call pay and comp time policies. Docket number 1812, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 24 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $16,799,440 to provide funding for the Boston Police Department for the fiscal year 24 increase contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. Docket number 1813. Message in order for a supplemental appropriation order for the Boston Police Department for fiscal year 24 in the amount of $30,799,440 to cover the fiscal year 24 cost contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. The terms of the contract are July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023, and July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. The major provisions of the contract include wage, waste, in, wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, and 2%. 1% and 2.5% to be given in July of each year of the contract term, as well the addition of the Transitional Career Award Program in July 2023. The contract also contains reforms related to discipline, officer return to duty, to the paid detail system, and union release. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Worrell, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President. The Committee on City Services and Innovation and Technology held a hearing on Tuesday, <coughs> December 12, 2023. It was joined by Council President Flynn, Council Murphy, Council Durkin, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Braden, and Council Louis Jen. Testing on behalf of the administration included James Williamson, Director of the Office of Budget uh, Management, Lou Mandarini, Senior Advisor for Labor, Jeremiah Hassan, Director of the Office of Labor Relations for Boston Public Schools, Boston Police Commissioner Michael Cox, Nicole Taub, Chief, Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Policy and Legal Affairs for the Boston Police Department. The administration presented details on collective bargaining agreements discussed in dockets number 1578 and 1579 focusing on the plan administration's association and Boston uh, Police Patrolmen Association. For the plan administration's association, the administration outlined the roles of representing employees overseeing custodial services, highlighting the importance of their work. Collective bargaining included provisions on holidays, salary increases, on-call stipends, and comp compensatory time caps. The administration justified the absence of overtime pay, attrib attributing it to historical agreements and essential year-round services provided. <clears throat> Regarding dockets number 1812 and 1813, the Boston Police Patrolman Association negotiation included minor provisions on holidays and major provisions on compensation, benefits, union release, medical leave, discipline, and detailed assignments. With regard to compensation and benefit provisions, the administration introduced changes in compensation and benefits aiming to address declining attrition rates, particularly for first-year officers. They emphasized the new TCAP Career Awards <coughs> program, offering additional weekly benefits based on an officer's tenure. This is separate from the annual cost of living increase and matches the bonus system used by our firefighters. The education incentive plan was also expanded, expanded providing a financial perk for those officers with degrees from eligible institutions. 
with regard to provisions for forming police, union, police policies on union release. The policies are aimed at ensuring adequate staffing while supporting union uh, participa participation, limiting the number of employees allowed for union businesses on duty from 54 to 45. Regarding medical leave, the agreement altered the arbitration process in case of disagreement between the department's physician and the officer's personal physician. Instead of arbitration, officers will be sent to an independent medical examiner for better, for better medical decisions. At different points over the years, an average of 10% of patrol officers have been on medical leave, so this should expedite a solution to any disagreements over that status. In disciplinary actions, the Internal Affairs Hearing Board and Trial Board determined charges and appeals, with the Commission having the final say. <clears throat> this agreement introduced 28 charges that an officer can't bring to arbitration. These charges range from drug, drug trafficking to extortion to attempted murder. Finally, with respect to provisions for form and policy surrounding detail assignments and shifts, the reforms and detail assignments prioritize public safety factors, introducing a new system, different, different, uh, different type one and type two priority uh, assignments. Type one detail assignments excluding traffic control must be filled by sworn officers, with traffic control assignments available for available to post-certified officers and contract a civilian agency if it's needed. The, the administration testified that 37% of details went unfilled in the city based on the old system, and so that reforms presented in this agreement should greatly reduce the number of unfilled details while also making our streets safer. The administration discussed plans for technology plat platform for detail assignments management, although a, a timeline wasn't provided, the administration also discussed working with the outside vendor, a vendor to train officers outside of BPD as well as civilian flaggers. Provisions also prevent officers from taking addition, additional compensated detail assignments while already on the clock. The agreement increased the pay for detail assignments with Type 1 details paying 68 per hour and, and $60 for others. Um, as chair of, uh, of the committee, I am recommending that docket numbers 1578, 1579, 1812 and 1813 ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rawl. Council Rawl, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology, <coughs> seeks acceptance of the committee report, passative docket 1578. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Mr. Clark, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1578. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1578 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. The docket has passed. Council Worrell, Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passative docket 1579. Mr. Kirk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1579. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1579 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. The docket has passed. Council Worrell, the Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report, passive docket 1812. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on doc number 1812. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Yes. 
Councillor Coletta, yes. Councillor Durkin. Councillor Durkin, yes. Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Lara. Councillor Lara, yes. Councillor Lujan. Yes. Councillor Lujan, yes. Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Murphy, yes. And Councillor Worrell. Yes. Councillor Worrell, yes. Docket number 1812 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. The docket has passed. Council Worrell, Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 1812. Before we do take a roll call vote, I do want to recognize Council Laura. Council Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I just want to take a moment before I vote on docket um, 1813. And I'm sorry that I didn't do it um, before we started doing our roll call vote to ensure that I go on the record to share um, some of my reflections on the contract that is before us today. Uh, as I, I think has become obvious given my last vote, I do plan on voting yes on the BPPA contract that is in front of the Boston City Council today. And I do that as an affirmation of the forward movement in this contract, but I don't want to do so without sharing some concerns that I have given all of the work that my office has done on ensuring that we're really looking at the police contract as the policy document that it is. I think that theoretically this contract has taken a lot of forward movement. And I think that the Boston Police Department and the City of Boston are from what I can see, having the same conversation. And we've come to agreement on two things that I think are incredibly important. One, that there are offenses that should, that should make it so that Boston police officers cannot return to work. We've come to an agreement on that. And now we have a list um, of possible criminal charges that would ultimately mean that there can't be arbitration for a Boston police officer to receive their, their job and their position back. Do I believe that that list is the correct list? No. Have we come to an agreement on the fact that there should be a list? Absolutely. I would be remiss if I didn't stand before this body today that to say that I'm deeply concerned about the fact that assault and battery, domestic assault and battery is not on this list and that the use of a sexist force is not on this list. I think that if you go down the list of offenses that's there now and you take a look at all of the offenses that Boston Police Department officers have been found guilty for or have lost their job for, you will see that not a lot operationally will change with the list that is in front of us. And I would like to hear in the future and really call on my council colleagues to keep an eye on what changes will happen based on the contract that is in front of us today. And so my first comments are about discipline. The second part of my comments are gonna be about the paid details part of this contract. The Boston Police Department and the administration have come to in a theoretical agreement that we do not need armed sworn officers doing detail work on the city of Boston. I think that's good, I think it's forward movement. For the first time in our city's history, since 1603, there is the ability for people who are not sworn officers to do paid details on the streets of the city of Boston. Not only is that historic, I think that it's monumental and it's a step in the right direction, which again is why I am gonna be voting for this contract. But are we breaking the monopoly for who? Are we breaking the monopoly to create more jobs for the people of our city with what is included here in the contract? The answer to that question is no. There is a hierarchy that is presented to us in the contract right now. That hierarchy presents five groups of people that outside of Boston Police Department officers now have access to the paid detail system here. Out of those five groups, only th three of those groups do not have a city of Boston residency requirement. And so although we are breaking the monopoly on paid details, we are creating second jobs for people who already have incomes, and we're breaking the monopoly not for people in the city of Boston who need it, but for John in situate, although I'm sure that John is a great guy. We need to make sure, either by way of ordinance or by way of holding this administration accountable, which has proven to be incredibly difficult when it comes to police and policing, that the jobs that we are creating are going to the people in the city of Boston. Our poverty rate in the city of Boston is at 20%. The childhood poverty rate here is at 28%. There are people in our city who need jobs, families who are struggling, and if we are going to invest our resources in ensuring that the members of the Boston Police Department are being paid adequately and are receiving their raises and are being commended for the work that they're doing with all of the benefits that are afforded to them in this contract, then we have to make sure that we are doing that for the benefit of the people of the city of Boston. As the contract stands now, we have made leaps and bounds theoretically. We have come to agreement about things that we've been struggling for decades to come to agreements to, but operationally, we are 
not going to be able to see a difference for the everyday people of the city of Boston if this council and the administration do not make a concerted effort to make sure that these provisions in this contract are implemented in a way that centers the people of the city of Boston. So again, I am going to be voting to pass this contract today, but I wanted to make sure that I went on the record as my last meeting to continue fighting not only for the workers of the city of Boston, but to make sure that we're building more jobs where they're most needed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Royo. Council Royo, you have the floor. Thank you, and I'll be brief. Uh, I also will be voting for this contract. I want to commend uh, the administration uh, and the Boston uh, Police Patrolmen's Association for coming to an agreement on uh, some longstanding issues, uh, such as opening the doors uh, to some civilian, uh, civilian members handling details. I think that's important. I also think it's important that uh, we outlined uh, sort of a list of offenses uh, that an officer can be fired for uh, without arbitration. Uh, I just want to note uh, some absences on that list that I hope uh, in the next iteration, which will not be that far away, that the council and the administration advocate for. Uh, for instance, many of these are higher level offenses, so uh, drug trafficking is on this list. Uh, I'm not certain when the last Boston police officer uh, was arrested uh, or indicted for drug trafficking. Uh, however, lower occluded like drug possession with intent to distribute, not on this list. Those kinds of families of things should be here. Uh, assault and battery to collect a loan, not sure. The last time we had a Boston police officer commit assault and battery for the express purposes of collecting a loan. Uh, however, unfortunately, I am aware of assault and battery on family household members, uh, and that should be on this list, otherwise known as a domestic. Uh, I think anybody who's committing assault and battery on family household members who's indicted or has an internal complaint sustained and by the trial board should not be wearing a badge and responding to assault and batteries on family and household domestic members. So that's hopefully something that uh, in the future both parties can agree to. Uh, and then finally, uh, I know we're joined by uh, Larry Calderon who was quoted as saying that the one thing that a uh, police officer dislikes probably the most is a dishonest police officer and yet missing from this list is forgery or fraud or perjury. Uh, anyone who is found to have perjured themselves on a stand or on a document or committed forgery or fraud, uh, whether that be with overtime or in the instances uh, like in 2012 where we had court OT where uh, officers were actually fraudulently or forging signatures for other members of the force. When we have situations like that, I think that should be something that you can face discipline uh, up to and including firing without arbitration. And so it is my hope that crimes of honesty, like forgery, fraud, like perjury, get added to this list in the future uh, because, frankly, uh, those are the kinds of things that we require from our officers every day. Every day uh, to testify in court, to uh, stand by their reports, to stand by the work they do. Uh, and so very happy that they were able to come to a compromise, very happy that they were able to come to agreement on what compensation should look like and what, uh, what civilian details should look like. And my hope is that this opens the door to stronger uh, reforms moving forward. Uh, so thankful to the administration for opening the door. I will be voting yes on this because I think these are important reforms. Uh, but uh, my hope is that the next iteration takes it a step further. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Uh, Mr. Clerk, we're, on, we're still on dock at 1812. Please, we'll do a roll call vote on that. Roll call vote on docket number 1813. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lujan. Yes. Councilor Lujan, yes. Councilor Mejia. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1813 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The docket is passed. We're on to docket 1721, Mr. Clark. Docket number 1721, petition for a special law relative to an act uh, relative to voting for all legal residents in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes the chair recognizes Council Royal, the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The Committee on Government Operations held a virtual working session 
uh, yesterday, Tuesday, December 12th, on docket 1721, petition for a special hour regarding an act relative to voting for all legal residents uh, in the city of Boston, which was referred to the committee on November 15th, 2023, and was sponsored by Councilor Lara. I'd like to thank my council colleagues, Councilor Lara, Louis Jen, Coletta, uh, Murphy, uh, and Flynn for attending, uh, and for Councilor Rell, who was unable to attend but provided a letter in his absence. Uh, I would also like to thank Commissioner Anita Tavares, uh, the Election Department, uh, and Sabino Pimonti uh, for attending as well to answer any questions that uh, folks had. I also uh, want to thank uh, Christine O'Donnell, uh, who without her work uh, would not have been able to get this uh, language ready and, and before the body today. So thank you for the time and effort that you put into this. Uh, the docket has been amended uh, in several really important ways uh, at the request of the election department. The ordered section has been amended to include, quote, provided that the general court may vary the form and substance of the request of legislation when the scope of the general public objectives of this position. It's just similar language to the Rent Stabilization Act that we uh, sent up uh, earlier this year. Essentially, uh, it gives the uh, state legislature the ability to edit any part of this document as they see fit or as they believe uh, wouldn't be merited uh, based on uh, their line of thinking moving forward on, on voting um, and any other edits that they may feel are necessary. Uh, in the amended draft, this group of non-citizens or immigrants with legal status is referred to as legal voting age residents. Uh, this addresses an issue that came up with using the term voter, uh, which has been clearly defined uh, in the Massachusetts general law as being a citizen. Uh, legal voting age residents in this docket is defined as anyone eligible to vote pursuant to this act in a local election or upon a local ballot question in the city of Boston. Further defined in this home rule is a deadline for legal voting age residents to register to vote, which is 10 days prior to all preliminary municipal elections, which also applies to change of address. Uh, those deadlines are consistent with requirements that we have for all eligible voters, uh, but were added at the request of the elections department. Uh, Mail-in voting and vote by mail for legal voting age residents are also spelled out in this amended docket, again, at the request of the elections department. So uh, both of these, uh, this original home rule petition mirrors in large part a uh, home rule petition put forward by my father and counselors Yancey and Turner uh, almost I want to say almost two decades ago, uh, which uh, I think failed 7-6. I think the only member of the body who was here for that vote was Councillor Flaherty, and he voted uh, in the affirmative. Because it was based on the language uh, back then, we did not have mail-in voting, we didn't have early voting, uh, and so that language was missing from the original draft that sampled heavily from the previous iteration. So now that that's been included to sort of modernize the docket. Uh, one other thing that is spelled out and is important uh, in this docket uh, is we changed the amended start date. We amended the start date. It was supposed to take place uh, upon being signed into law by the governor, which, you know, these things as they go through the state house can take a while. Uh, we added an additional cycle to that. So essentially, instead of taking effect immediately upon passage, it would take effect one election cycle from passage to give the election department uh, the time to prepare and to prep and to do all the things that they have to do to ensure that uh, it works. So essentially, when it's signed by the governor, not when it's passed by this body, but when it is eventually signed by the governor, it would not take effect immediately upon that signature. It would take effect upon the next municipal election uh, following that signature date. So not the one that's right there, but the one right after. Uh, the amendments before you today address concerns that were laid out yesterday's uh, during yesterday's working session, prior to that working session, attorneys from the Lawyers for Civil Rights uh, provided written testimony in support of this docket and this process. Uh, Lawyers for Civil Rights pointed out that in Vermont, the Superior Court over there upheld voting for non-citizens since the legislature had the power to regulate qualifications of municipal voters, which I believe the legislature in Massachusetts also has the power to do. And uh, though we have not had one of these laws challenged here in Massachusetts, uh, the likelihood is that uh, Judicially, they would look at surrounding states and, and see how they've handled the matter. Uh, the docket is also similar to ones that were passed by Cambridge, Somerville, and Newton. Uh, so, you know, we're not breaking new ground here. Uh, Cambridge, Somerville, and Newton have all passed similar petitions uh, to the State House. Uh, they all require that non citizens sign under pains and penalties of perjury. I know that that language. Uh, worried some folks, the, the idea of signing under pains and penalties of perjury, but that is language that is reflected in all three of those cities is dockets and home rule petitions. Uh, so that would be Newton, uh, Somerville, and Cambridge who have all passed similar legislation. 
all require that language or, or rather have that language. Uh, and essentially what it is is that they sign under pains and penalties of perjury, that they reside in the municipality where they wish to vote. Uh, and so we will be keeping that language in the petition that we sent up to the State House. Uh, as chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I move that this docket ought to pass in its amended draft and I would turn the floor uh, to the original sponsor for any statements or questions or comments that she may have. Thank you, Council Rail. The chair, recognize, the chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I want to start off by thanking the chair and all of my council colleagues for all of their work and their suggestions to ensure that this homo petition was not only ready but was legally sound. Uh, I also want to extend my thank yous, similar to the chair, to Christine, who was working on this very late last night to make sure that we got it ready today, and to Councilor Arroyo Silva staff, Jordan Frias, who's also here. Um, they did an incredible amount of work to turn this around and preparing it for today. I also want to thank the administration. I want to extend my thank you to the Elections Department. Uh, I've been working on this since I came into office two years ago, and we've worked with um, Yusufi Vali, who is now the Mayor's Deputy Chief of Staff, but used to be the Director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement, and also Monique Wen, who is the um, current Director of the Mayor's Office of uh, Immigrant Advancement, the NAACP, and last but not least, um, Lawyers for Civil Rights, who have been an incredible partner in ensuring that we can move this legislation forward. Uh, we have been able to be in conversation. I want to take a moment to thank um, Clara Goldberg, who is my former policy manager, um, Sean Waddington, who um, did all of the work to meet with all of the cities across the country and schedule all of the meetings across the country that had implemented this legislation, and most recently for the past couple of months, BJ Oswago, who has been moving this legislation across the finish line. It has definitely been um, a labor, uh, but it has been a labor of love, and I'm really excited to have this in front of this body today, um, as it was the issue that I gave my maiden speech on on my first day as an elected official here. Voting is an inherent right that this country, that this country was founded on, and yet throughout history, everyone has not had the right to vote. And although civic engagement has gone and always has gone beyond the ballot box, expanding the electorate and ensuring that everyone eligible to vote is engaged is crucial to maintaining a healthy functioning democracy. This body has often shared in this commitment to removing barriers and nurturing a deeper, more participatory democracy at every level of our government. When I ran for public office, my father stood outside of the Doris Bunty Apartments in Eggleston Square from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the evening on election day. And he canvassed his entire building, stringing together whatever few English words he knew. And he, excuse me. My dad couldn't be here today, so. Um, he strung together whatever few English words he had to hand out literature to anyone who would listen, to help them and convince them to cast their ballot for his daughter. But yet, in spite of all of his hard work and his pride in seeing my name, my dad could not get a chance to see my name on the ballot. My father, although he is a 30-year resident, a legal resident of this city, could not vote for his youngest daughter. And his story is the story of thousands of legal residents in the city of Boston who work, pay taxes, raise their children, and participate in every way in strengthening the fabric of our city, yet cannot cast their ballot for the representatives who are making decisions about their daily lives. With this home rule petition, this council can help get us closer to ensuring that we the people means all of the people. One where the democratic process starts at the ballot box, but it expands beyond the walls of local government into every workplace, home, and school, so that all of our working class people who make this country, our state, and our city what it is today have the power to collectively self-determine their future. One thing that I know is that democracy does not come from the top, but it actually comes from the bottom, and it does not reverberate from the center but instead it echoes inward from the farthest margins. And by passing this home petition, the city of Boston will be joining cities like Oakland, San Francisco, the District of Columbia, uh, Newton, Amherst, Cambridge, Somerville, Mount Rainier, Riverdale Park, Tacoma Park, Burlington, Montpelier, and Minuski, Vermont, um, in really making true on that promise. And so I am asking my council colleagues to vote in favor of sending 
this home rule petition up to the state house. There's obviously um, a long ways for this home rule petition to go before it becomes the law in the city of Boston, but I think that we've done an incredible amount of work to make sure that this is legally sound and ready for us to let the legislative body of the state make decisions about what this looks like and really affirm to our immigrant communities, to our legal residents who give so much to our city that we want to hear their voice and we want to be accountable to them. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report passage of this docket 17. Okay. I'm sorry, Council Acquetta, I, I didn't see you. Um, the chair recognizes Council Acquetta. Council Acquetta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, and I want to thank um, everybody who uh, had a, um, a role to play in this. I see uh, former Councilor Felix Arroyo. Thank you so much for your leadership on this. Um, Councilor Lara. Um, I, you know, I, I've gone back and forth on this issue. I have remarks planned, but just know that I intend to vote yes on this. Um, I see the amendments here, although I do wish that there was a lot more voices at the table in this go around. But um, I'll stick. I'll stay on the script because I know my staff will be upset if I don't. Um, this city has a rich immigrant history for those seeking opportunities for themselves, their children, and grandchildren. There's a plaque dedicated to these individuals uh, on this building speaking <coughs> about Boston as a gateway, America's promise, and a life filled with opportunity. Most of us have our own Im uh, immigration story, some more uh, removed than others, but we still find commonality in our family searching for economic mobility, safety, and stability here in the United States. A lot of neighbors of mine in East Boston are legal permanent residents. They are TPS holders and dreamers. They pay taxes, are business owners, and community leaders. They are city employees. They are my friends and chosen family. We have stood in solidarity many times with them when demanding to enjoy the same access to opportunity and prosperity as any of us on this body. Fully acknowledging we are not without our, our faults, uh, relatively speaking, as a major metropolitan city, Boston is welcoming and inclusive of our immigrant neighbors. Over the last five years, the city has moved to ensure that folks know what's happening in their own communities by better language access services, ELL courses, a civic academy to train future leaders through MOYA, small business investments, and participatory budgeting that allows for direct oversight of city resources. We have spent millions of dollars housing asylum seekers over the past year to help ensure that they have a supportive ecosystem around them. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the people of Boston have elected a near majority city council of either immigrants or children of immigrants. I know this is a well-intentioned measure put forth by the sponsor. I've already stated that I generally agree with the idea for legal tax-paying, law-abiding Bostonians to have their voices heard at its most fundamental level. When looking at what's been filed, uh, as well as taking stock in recent conversations we've had within the last week, there are voices that I would have liked to hear from to help craft um, an even better piece of legislation. The Elections Department just yesterday is on record saying that they are concerned about impl implementation capacity. That is something that we should take seriously. They require buy-in from the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Office and or serious investment from the city in building and maintaining a new voter database. That's something we should all consider as we uh, go forth in the budget process and if this passes. They also don't know what the implications might be if one person votes in, a wrong, in the wrong election, if their eligibil eligibility for citizenship would be compromised or how we can safeguard precious personal information of these individuals. We never heard directly from the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Office or the Office of Immigrant Advancement and their ability to ensure proper civic education. We never heard from leading groups such as MIRA or Project Citizenship to talk through any concerns they might have. There's the need for everyone registering to vote to have an immigration consult or attorney. There's questions around where community-based legal providers are on this. Additionally, who would be responsible for paying for that? I want to be real about what comes next after this vote for my community. What we're about to sign off on will go to the mayor for her review. She may or may not sign it. And then up to the State House to essentially die with other home rule petitions that don't have broad support or have legal ambiguities. This is based on what other cities and towns in Massachusetts have sent up in the past. The population in which we are trying to enfranchise deserves a tangible pathway. This docket is certainly a starting point. There's no doubt about it. Understanding the context, however, it needs to be said that passage today would largely serve as a symbolic gesture in this moment in time. After checking with members of my community, to them a yes vote would show solidarity with those who are here legally, pay taxes, and are valued members, not just of East Boston, but Boston as a whole. I do intend to vote yes for them and them only. 
Looking forward, if we are endeavoring to build foundations for a successful movement on this matter, it behooves this Council and the next to be informed by robust engagement from all communities, guidance of multiple legal scholars, and participation of bureaucratic systems that, whether we like it or not, will oversee its implementation and administration. Thank you. Thank you, Council Carter. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I just want to thank my colleague, Councillor Lada, um, for shepherding this through the legislative um, process. You know, I wasn't going to speak. I was just going to do my vote, and that's it. But I was really moved by your um, your story about your dad and the countless other immigrants who every day sit on the sidelines when decisions are being made for them, without them, and so. In the spirit of channeling on those voices into this chamber, regardless of what country they've come from, um, they ha are here legally and participating in democracy in many different ways. And so in the spirit of understanding that we have over 68,000 immigrants who have legal status here, um, they represent 29% of the city's population. And that means 29% of the city's po population does not have a chance to participate in government processes and build a government by the people for the people. And so as I always talk about all means all, I want to make sure that we are affirming all of us here in the city of Boston and creating an opportunities for people to be able to have a voice and a vote and who um, represents them. So just wanted to uplift you and your leadership in this space. And as someone who became a US citizen through the naturalization process, and failed the test the first time, I know how difficult it could be. Um, and so I, I know that this is one of the, the greatest gifts that we have once we become a US citizen is the right to vote. But um, it's costly and it prevents a lot of people um, from participating in the process when they don't have the financial means to be able to go through that process. So um, just wanted to uplift that um, and wanted to just thank you for your leadership and I'll be voting yes in favor of this, thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The Chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and obviously thanks to, to the makers. Uh, Boston's uh, growing diversity and level of community involvement is what makes our city great. Uh, however, there are and still remain legal concerns that we need to be mindful of uh, when we talk about non-citizens voting. Unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity to participate um, at the virtual hearing. Um, but I do know that our own commissioner, uh, Tavares, through uh, the Secretary of State's office, and arguably one of the best in the business, uh, emphasized that there are legal concerns around classifications and how to proceed with non-citizen voting under state law. Uh, I also do remember, as former chair of government operations, uh, testimony uh, where they indicated that non-citizens uh, voting in municipal elections may have unintended consequences. Those unintended consequences is that they may mistakenly register to vote uh, and or vote in federal or state elections, which would seriously jeopardize uh, their opportunity to become a legal citizen. I, I don't know anything more devastating than that, uh, than being pre preparing and waiting and then um, you know, either mistakenly registering or voting uh, an election that you're not supposed to. And for me, that's just still too great of a risk uh, to take uh, at this point. Uh, I do echo the sentiments of uh, some colleagues that more folks should have been at the table uh, kind of uh, dealing with some of these issues. But again, I, uh, I think in this space, uh, uh, taking a lead from our commissioner uh, who was in contact with our Secretary of State, I think kind of sums it up for me. But through that, uh, respectfully, we'll be voting no. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Royal seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 1721 in a new draft. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1721. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Nay. Council Baker, nay. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, uh, Council Braden yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin? Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Council Flynn? No. Council Flynn, no. Council Flaherty? No. Council Flaherty, no. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. 
Council Louisiana, yes. Council Mejia. Council Mejia, C. Council Murphy. No. Council Murphy, no. Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Document number 1721 has received eight votes in the affirmative and four votes in the negative. The docket has passed in a new draft. We're on to motions, orders, resolutions. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1824, please. Docket number 1824, Councilor Murphy and Flynn offer the following. Order requesting certain information under section 17F regarding Boston Public Schools Code of Conduct violations data. Chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. And I know that we all have a copy of this 17F, so I won't go into the details, but I do just want to say that I'm hoping as we go into the next year, the new year, that the school department will be more open, more transparent, and committed to working closely with this body to ensure that all students in the Boston Public School are receiving a safe and high quality education. So thank you, and I hope we pass the 17 after this information. Council Murphy, Flynn, seek suspension of the rules, adoption of this docket, 1824. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the docket is passed. Thank you. We're on to late files. I've been informed by the clerk that there are. Oh, we still. Okay. Okay. Before we get to late files, we'll do um, personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, can you um, read the first personnel order into the record? Docket number 1825, Council Flynn for Council Fernandez Anderson. She has seek suspension of the rules and passage of this. Personnel order, all those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. This personnel order has been passed. Mr. Clerk, the next uh, personnel order. Well, that was the only one. That's the only one, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, now we're into late files. I've been informed by the clerk that there are 15 late file matters. Most of them, 13 of them are personnel orders. So, so 13 of them are late, are personnel orders. One's an absence letter. Okay, and the other is a resolution. I, before we take a vote on them, I just want to confirm everyone has the absence letter and the resolution on their desk. I'll take, I'll take a minute to ensure that it's on everyone's desk at this time. We're going to take a vote on all of these late file matters. All in favor of adding all late file matters into the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay, the, the ayes have it. The late file matters are added. Yeah, okay. We'll do the absence letter first, Mr. Clark. First late file, absence letter, dear President Flynn and esteemed council colleagues, I hope this message finds you well. I regret to inform you that I'll be unable to attend today's city council meeting. I'll review the recording for my records and will follow up with all matters that require my attention or input. Uh, sincerely, Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson. This will be placed on file. Mr. Clark, the next late file matter. Uh, order offered, a uh, resolution offered by Councilors Michael Flaherty and, and Ed Flynn. Resolution recognizing December 25th, 2023 as Anne Marie Sugar Long Day in the city of Boston. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Clark. Yeah. 
The chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty. Yes. Council of Flaherty, Council Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This is passed. Mr. Clerk, we're on to the personnel orders. Uh, first personnel order, Council Flynn for Council Coletta. Chair moves for passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. I'll post say nay, the ayes have it. This personnel order has been has passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Coletta. Chair moves for passage of this personnel order. All in favor say aye. Aye. I'll post say nay, the ayes have it. This late file personnel order has passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Durkin. Chair moves to pass it of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order has passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. Chair moves to pass it of this personnel order. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order has passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. Chair moves to pass it of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order has passed. Personnel order for Council Flynn. Chair moves to passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. Personnel order for Council Flynn. Chair moves to passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order is passed. Personnel order for Council Flynn. Chair moves the passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order is passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Lara. Chair moves the passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order is passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Lara. Chair moves the passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order has passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Mejia. The Chair moves the passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order is passed. Council of Flynn for Council of Mejia. The Chair moves the passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. And Council of Flynn for Council of Murphy. The Chair moves for passage of this personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This personnel order has passed. The The chair recognizes <laughs> Councillor Baker. Mr. Uh, Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to reconsider docket 1819. So we can take action on that. There's a motion on the floor to reconsider. Is there a second? second. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend $816,000 to expand the electric blue blue bike program. Personally, I don't think they're good operators in the city. They come and they set up wherever they want. Nobody gets any sort of uh, heads up of where they're going to go, that sort of stuff. That being said, if we don't pass this today, it's months before before we're able to enact this. So I would like to suspend suspend and pass this, this, this docket and accept the grant for $816,000. Thank you, Council Baker. Council Baker seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this docket 1819. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This is passed. Thank you, Council Baker. We're on to green sheets. Anyone looking to take a, a matter from the green sheets, please let me know. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I'm um, looking to move on behalf of the Committee uh, uh, on Ways and Means. I'm looking to move docket number 1574 MSBA grants um, on page two of the green sheets, currently assigned for further action for its second reading. Uh, full detail is on page 20. Thank, thank you, Council Louis-Jean. Mr. Kirk, can you read that docket into the record? And then we'll pull the committee to ensure it's properly before the body. Message in order for your approval an order authorizing the City of Boston to appropriate the amount of $17,165,000 for the purpose of paying the costs associated with the boiler, roof, windows, and door replacement projects at the following schools. The Jeremiah E. Burke High School, the English High School, Dennis C. Haley Pilot School, and the Dr. William W. Henderson Inclusion Upper School. The City of Boston has applied for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, docket number 1574. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can we poll the committee to ensure it's properly before the body? The Committee on Ways and Means, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Worrell, Councilor Flaherty, Yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Lujan. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. And Councilor Braden. Yes. Properly. It's properly before the body. The chair recognizes Councilor Lujan. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you uh, to the clerk. And as a reminder, this docket is for an appropriation in the amount of seventeen million one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars to cover the costs associated with a boiler, roof, windows, and door replacement projects at the Jeremiah Burke High School in Dorchester, the English High School in uh, Jamaica Plain, the Dennis C. Haley Pilot School in Rosendale, and the uh, Henderson Inclusion Upper School in Dorchester. The Committee on Ways and Means held a hearing on this docket on November 16th, and the Council took our, our first vote on this docket on November 29th. I ask now for your second vote in the affirmative to pass these grants. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis Jean. This will be a second vote. Council Louis Jean moves to take the second reading of this docket, which is 1574. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Second reading on docket number 1574. Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Yes. Council Baker, yes. Council Braden. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Durkin. Yes. Councilor Durkin, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lujan. Yes. Councilor Lujan, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Docket number 1574, having received its second reading, received 11 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This, this docket has received its second reading, and it has passed. I would like to recognize former city councilor, current state legislator, Rob Consalvo. Good to be with you, Councilor. Mr. Clerk, um, I understand docket 1818, 1818 will also be brought up before the green sheets? Yeah, please read it into the record, Mr. Clerk, and then we'll do a roll call vote to ensure it's properly before the body. Docket number 1818, an ordinance amending chapter uh, 11, section 6.9 of the City of Boston Code, ordinances regarding permits for street work. Committee on Government Operations, Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Louis Jean. Council Worrell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're polling the committee for the docket number eight. Docket number um, 1818. That's not That's, oh, it's, you're not polling it? Okay. No. The chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, if this is on docket uh, 
1818, the ordinance amending Chapter 11. Yeah, that docket, uh, Council Lara uh, and I as chair uh, had a conversation that that will not be coming up. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else looking to discuss something from the green sheet? We're on to the consent agenda. I've been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda. He has presented all those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're going to go to memorials, but before we before we do that, I do want to I do want to give my departing colleagues the opportunity to speak um, about their experience, and want to thank them for their commitment to the residents of Boston and and to the city, to the to this body, and want to start with want to start with. Council Flaherty, and then whoever wants to go after Council Flaherty. But at this time, the chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's been a, a great 20-year uh, run, so got lots to say, but uh, we'll pull it together in, in a few minutes. And it's mostly thank you, uh, my family first and foremost, uh, my beautiful wife, uh, and uh, my my children. <laughs> With the hours, uh, seven days a week, nights, mornings, weekends, uh, to be able to have someone holding the fort, raising your children while you're out in community, you're uh, building relationships, you're uh, solving problems, uh, you're visiting uh, other folks in their neighborhood um, uh, and, and, um, and working to make our city better, to move our city forward. I've had a front row seat to a lot of the city's changes uh, and played an active role in it. And, um, and feel a great sense of pride, I think, in, in when I started in this business to where, where we are now. And I uh, can hold my head up high, uh, know that worked extremely hard uh, for the betterment of our city uh, and uh, did it um, to the best of my ability, obviously, with, with, with class and dignity and respect. Uh, and, and, uh, and for that, uh, I'm grateful for the upbringing of uh, my dad, obviously, um, big Mike Flaherty, but also the legendary um, late great Peg Flaherty. Um, so for my parents and what they've sort of taught and shown me uh, how to conduct yourself, how to work with others, how to get along, how to build bridges, but most importantly, my mother would say, always call people back. Uh, so if I can leave something with my uh, colleagues now, it's call people back. Might not be a pleasant conversation. You may not have the answer. You just make sure you call them back. Um, maybe a big issue, maybe a small issue, but that's the most important issue in that person's life or in that family's life. And taking a couple of minutes just to return the phone call, you may still have to get some answers for them, or you may have to do a little more work on it. But at least you call them, letting them know that uh, you uh, you're on it. And I think that's a big piece of this. Clearly, uh, my brother and sister uh, and their kids for their continued love and support. And uh, my aunts, my uncles, uh, my cousins. Uh, we make a whole precinct, as you all know. I'm pretty much related to everybody, I think. So, um, and that's been a big uh, tool for me as I go across the city, uh, coming from my base area, but to be able to build those relationships. Uh, my city council family, the 40 uh, councilors that I've served with, current and past. I know what my colleague, Councilor Consavo, is there. I think Councilor Tito Jackson is here, still here. Um, they, uh, and I think that may be the most. Um, I've served with uh, 40 colleagues here in the council, three mayors, uh, three clerks, uh, three assistant clerks, one stenographer. Uh, she's been here since day one, uh, Allie. <laughs> she does a great job with the council in transcribing. Um, central staff, um, you all know who you are. You're here. You've been a big part of this body. Uh, we appreciate and respect the work that you do. Uh, oftentimes it's behind the scenes, but uh, it's not lost um, the value uh, that you add uh, to this body. Um, and let me not forget our 14th city councilor, uh, Mike LaRocca. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. It was, it was literally had me back. When I sat over there, he was there. When I sat over there, he was there. But someone that has his finger on the pulse in the city, uh, not afraid to tell you how things are going, how he feels, what people are saying out there. So he's been a great resource. His commitment and dedication uh, to the city, but also to this body and the respect that he shows this body uh, is commendable, Mike. So I'll see you Thank you. My staff, obviously, I've been blessed. Uh, you're only as good as the people uh, that you're working with and behind you. Uh, I've got an incredible staff from the day that I, I walked in the door here, uh, many of whom are here and uh, many of whom had stopped in and had left. And so uh, to all of them, my existing current staff, uh, no, uh, Paul, Mary, Claire, uh, Kathy, uh, Trish, uh, they do a phenomenal job uh, keeping, obviously, the, the, uh, the trains running. My campaign team, I argue I probably have the best campaign team uh, in the city, uh, and I can be boastful of that uh, in every neighborhood. Uh, I do extremely well. Uh, I go out, uh, obviously, topping the ticket because of those folks uh, advocating for me in their respective communities, allowing me to borrow their credibility with their family, with their friends, with their neighbors. And so uh, I've been blessed uh, from day one uh, to make sure that I surround myself with good, competent, capable people who are in things for the right reasons. They care about our city. They want to advance things that are happening in their neighborhood. Uh, residents of Boston, the relationships and friendships that I've been able to build, uh, lasting friendships uh, that from door knocks to community events to ribbon cuttings to campaigns, it's all, all of it's included in that and making sure that um, everyone is treated with dignity and respect, whether you call my office, you see me in the neighborhood or you have an issue. We don't always bat a thousand. We don't bat a thousand here on this floor, uh, but I think it's important that it's always been a two-way street uh, with me and my team. Uh, and uh, the residents uh, in the city. And as I have referenced that, uh, it's all been about moving Boston. Uh, it's not about us, it's about the people we serve. And so um, I, um, you know, I've, I've, I've given a lot uh, to this job, but this job has given me so much more. Uh, and it's, it's with that uh, that obviously I regret, you know, not being able to, to, to continue on. But I think it's time uh, in consult, cons consultation with, with my wife and kids and my family um, I'll be watching, so uh, hopefully I don't have to have a Flaherty 3.0 and have to come back. Um, but, um, but no, it's the work that you do here, it's the relationships you build here, it's the friendships you build here uh, that you'll carry with you for the rest of life. So whatever capacity I'm in, I'm a phone call away for current staff, phone call away for former staff. Um, not going anywhere, born and raised here uh, in the city, raised my family here in the city, and we're staying and we want to make sure that uh, the city continues to move forward, that we continue to be the best city in the country, we continue to be the safest city, uh, and that we continue to talk about and be boastful about our colleges, our universities, our hospitals, our community health centers, financial services, life centers. We have a lot of natural strengths here, folks, that other cities, uh, we're the envy of so many other cities. Uh, and working those partnerships, working those relationships is what makes our city great. And I would suggest that we need to do a little bit more of that here on the council, working together, um, getting to know each other a little bit better, uh, rolling up the sleeves, being willing to broker compromise. You don't always have to have a whole loaf. You can have a half a loaf. You can have a quarter of a loaf um, and still make sure that we're moving our city forward. So uh, with that, um, I just want to thank you, uh, obviously, Council President, for the trust that you've put in me into the committee assignments that I've had, the friendship that we've had uh, growing up in political households. Uh, Clearly, your dad, my dad served together in the legislature, so we would see each other up in the halls of state house, would see each other down the rink, would see each other down the ball fields. Um, but the Flint's and Flaherty's have become very close. You've been a big part of that. Um, so I appreciate the work you do. Uh, you weren't always handed sort of a, a great deck um, to deal with uh, this last term, but I can tell you I appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the time you put in. Uh, we have an expression in Southie that Ed Flynn will go to an envelope opening, uh, and, and, it's, and it's true, and it's endearing, and it's testament to how much he cares about people, all people, and that's been the role here. As your citywide city councilor, to the voters and to the residents of the city, it has been an absolute honor and a privilege to represent you here, and, uh, and it has been about representing all people. Whether you call my office, you come by the office, you stop me in the street, it's about how can I help? What can we do? This business is about helping people. And if anyone thinks it's about anything else, you're in the, line, in the wrong line of work. This is about rolling up the sleeves and doing that basic sort of city service, gritty, 
uh, connecting people to resources, helping someone navigate the bureaucracy, solving a problem in their neighborhood street. And it literally can go from uh, a street cleaning issue to a missing stop sign to a shooting in a neighborhood, and it's all of the above. Uh, we have the opportunity to work together moving forward. Uh, I want to participate in some capacity. I know the mayor will have me busy doing some different stuff, but uh, that said, it's been a pleasure uh, to serve the people of Boston on this body. Uh, we've done a lot of great work. We've helped a lot of people, this body and others that I've worked with, Robbie, Tito, others uh, that have all called over the last several weeks. And so uh, hopefully there'll be the likes of another. Michael Flaherty will walk through the door. Uh, but in the meantime, if I can offer just little bits and pieces, uh, if you can continue uh, that great service uh, to the people of Boston in your respective districts or at large, uh, would all be doing a great thing. So let's continue to try to pull it together, work together. And it's not about us. It's about people we serve. So thank you all, and uh, best of luck. Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you and your families. And know that there's a piece of this will always be with me, and like it was with uh, past councils. So thank you, and God bless. Isn't going to be another Michael Flaherty that's going to walk through that door. <laughs> Michael Flaherty also asked if his pal there behind us could be placed on the payroll, but we can't do that, Mike. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. I do want to call next Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Mr. President, I just have one request. Everybody that I'm talking to is behind me. Uh, there, is a, there is a protocol for a person taking the desk. Am I allowed to do that? You are, you are Council Baker. Oh, are you OK with that? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. And, and, and I do, I will extend that, um, Thank you for that. Thank option you. as well to um, my other colleagues. I would, I'm sorry I didn't extend to um, my, my colleague from South. I don't want to stay. <laughs> I don't want to stay if I get um, it. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Um, I, I first wish to extend a heartfelt uh, grace and compassion and best wishes to all of the people that sit here in this chamber here today, all my colleagues, all my past colleagues, and the people that will sit in these chairs after us. Um, Thank central staff. Ellen, of course, thank you for being here, and Alex, and everybody, everybody here that makes this work. Um, I'd like to thank Nick Collins for being the first elected that um, bet on me. He saw value in me and um, helped me to organize and helped my family to organize and gave, put us on the path for us to be able to have an amazing, amazing campaign 12 years ago. I was the underdog. I wasn't, I wasn't in the system. I was quite literally on the outside of it. I had lost my job at the printing department. But during that first campaign, I made a promise, and the promise was to be a full-time city councilor and have a strong, independent voice. I think we can agree on the full time, and I think we can agree on the independent voice. I think I delivered on those promises, and it's been a pleasure to, to do all that stuff. Um, I have to thank all my, and I've thanked everybody. We had a party the other night, and I, and I thanked all my staff, but I can't not thank you again, because being my staff has been more like being my family than just being a staff. I literally feel like I'm losing my limbs when I'm losing my staff. But I know we're going to continue to be friends and we're going to continue to work together and I hope to be including people in the work that I do moving forward. As a mentor said to me about my 12 years on, on the city council, 
you know, we're talking and thinking about the 12 years. And in, in the, the first campaign that, that I had really molded me, really prepared me to be a city council that was going to show up for the district, he said to me that I served with honor and distinction. That's pretty cool for someone to look at me and think that I have honor and I have distinction. After that first campaign, I had one conversation. It was with my congressman, Congressman Lynch. He said to me that a lot of times, especially coming from a neighborhood like mine, that you get elected your first time because of who your parents were and what your parents did. My parents were giants. My father was an icon in the recovery community before anybody was allowed to talk. You literally, the AA, you were not supposed to use people's last name. And we would all say, Dad, why are you Mr. Baker? I thought we were supposed to have an anonymity. But he helped thousands of people get to a point, and it was probably driven by my mother because she was a much stronger personality. He was able to help thousands and thousands of people get through the turmoil in life that, and back then it was all alcohol. We weren't even ready for the drugs yet. Um, and my mother, Eileen, she had a fifth grade education. Her father was illiterate. She came here basically alone from Montreal. She voted forever. We realized when she died at 90, we had to give the state more money because she was never naturalized. She voted the whole time. I don't know if that has to do with what Michael Flaherty was talking about. <laughs> but I wear, I wear purple here today for my mother. She was the toughest person in the family. Her, 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 her family in Villa Salle in Montreal had their own, they had their own nickname. They were the Fighting O'Connors in Villa Salle. So you can figure how that house was a little bit tough. But I wear purple in honor of my mother and my father because purple's a heel in color. And I think the city of Boston more than ever needs us all to be together on things, legitimately together, not just saying we're together, not just saying everybody's involved really being involved in each other's life and knowing who people are. Purple also is the color of Alzheimer's and it's also the color of recovery. Which, when my father was dragging drunk husbands out of the house to bring them to meetings, my mother was wrapping herself around the wives of those husbands. And that work brought her to, with friends of hers, Strong Dorchester women, a lot of them probably like her, not with much education and, you know, varying backgrounds. They got together, girls' night out. We need to do something, because it was around the time when doctors weren't visiting houses anymore and they weren't, they weren't as available. So her and her friends got together. They pro procured a building on Dot Ave. Their husbands, my father included, Mr. Shaughnessy and everybody that were workers, they did the electrical, they did the plumbing, they did the build out. My mother and her friends hired the nurses and the doctors. And they, and they formed the Little House Health Center, which through my entire life, everybody that I knew from a neighborhood got their health care at the Little House Health Center. My wife, she was a Southie transport. She actually got her, her health care there also. So I wear this color so we can heal and so I can honor my parents. The honor of being able to serve District 3 in the city of Boston, coming from where I came, I was a high school graduate, never went to college, was a printer, always worked on campaigns, but never saw myself as the person that was in front of you speaking to you. Never saw myself doing this. But I saw a need. I thought my neighborhood was underserved. The police never showed up. The streets were dirty. We had the red line running through, running through our neighborhoods. It's where a lot of the crime was happening. I didn't feel like people were listening to me, listening to our neighborhood. 
So I'm just overwhelmed, overwhelmed with gratitude and thankfulness that the people in Boston, that the people in District 3, that the people in Dorchester on the South End and Lower Roxbury had the faith in me. The 12th of 13 and the Baker's Dozen, they had the faith in me. I spoke for them. That's an amazing responsibility. And I ate it up. I loved it. I had a reporter, I forget who it was, Herald of the Globe asked me a couple weeks ago, did you like your job? I said, I loved my job. But you seem angry. I said, of course, I'm angry. Whatever. But I still love my job. I love helping the people of Boston. I love being able to call the governor, senators, people to help people that don't have a voice. So you think a lot about legacy. I think a lot about legacy. What's, what is it? What's it going to be? I saved a tree here. I was able to get a playground there, a library there. That's all legacy stuff. That's good stuff. But at the end of the day, none of it really matters. The votes don't matter. The streets are always going to have problems. You're always going to have people calling looking for housing and looking for, for oil or heat in the winter time. Thanksgiving comes. People need to be fed. So I think about legacy. And my legacy sitting right over there. My wife and my two children. Go ahead, you can put your head down. <laughs> my wife and I have changed generational maybe dysfunction in both of our lives, in her life and in my life. And we try and dispense that on our children so they can go out and they can do good things in the world and they can be good people. That's my legacy. Um, it was great to hear Michael talk. He's been a good friend and he gets it. He knows that ultimately it's about helping people. It's about helping people to help the city succeed and flourish. Um, I hope in my next life, which starts in a couple weeks, that I'm able to train and mentor young people. I hope to plant a thousand trees in the next 10 years. Yes, I'm a, I'm a tree hugger. Nobody's ever asked me really who I am, but I'm a tree hugger. I love trees more than people a lot of times. Um, but it's difficult to say what an honor this has been for me, someone that has always been the worker in the campaign. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And a lot of times when people show up in campaigns, they say, I'll do whatever you want me to do. That person isn't going to do anything. <laughs> Give them one task and send them out the door. I was a person that literally did everything, whatever a campaign needed. And when my campaign kicked off, my brothers, and my nieces, and my nephews, and my sisters, and my cousins, and my uncles, and my friends. We all gathered. We gave my neighborhood someone to vote for. A lot of times, people don't have anybody to vote for. Um, so I'm glad I was able to do that. Trying to go out on a message of love, trying to have love in my heart, because I spent some time with anger in my heart, and that's not good for anybody. So I wish everybody the best. I wish everybody a good Christmas. I wish everybody a healthy, happy life. And let's spread the love and let's try and let's hope for, for a better city, whatever that means. I think we can get there. And again, like Council Flaherty says, and how good was it to see Flaherty get a little bit emotional there? That was, you know, we haven't seen that, but that was good. He had to leave. Um, <laughs> But I'm just so thankful and so grateful. I can't even say it enough. And if anybody wants to have an appetizer or a beer with me, I'll be at the um, clocks. clocks. <laughs> yeah. Twelve years ago, we started at Clocks after the inauguration. My kids were five years old. They're 17 and beautiful over there. Now that they weren't beautiful then. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, if anybody wants to join me for an appetizer and a beer, I'll be at clocks probably in a half an hour, an hour or whatever. Thank you, everybody. This has been an amazing experience for me. And I'm actually 
37 years in the city. I'm not coming back in the city hall to do anything anymore unless I'm coming to say hi or whatever. 37 years in the city, 18 years old walking up from, from Don Bosco. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you, Council Baker. At this time, I want to recognize Council of Royo and Council Royo, if you want to speak from the podium. Thank you. Uh, you know, I didn't really prepare any notes for this because I figured I'm better when I don't, uh, to be honest with you. So. Uh, I just have some general rules. And so uh, the first one is that I want to just really make clear how grateful I am to the residents of District 5 uh, for giving me the honor uh, and the ability to advocate here on this council for, for them and for the neighborhoods that I grew up in. Uh, you know, I never took that for granted. Uh, I've always respected uh, the responsibility uh, that was placed upon my shoulders by my district uh, to advance uh, issues that frankly hadn't always been discussed or advanced on this council um you know my district has changed a lot i, I uh, when i first uh you know i come from a political family and and boston politics is something like uh an extension of my being and so you know i used to watch this pbs documentary which i would recommend uh for folks who want to sort of get a time capsule uh, it's good Michael left. It, it's about Menino running for city council. Uh, but it's, a, it's essentially a time capsule of my district from like 1970, uh, 1983, uh, and, or 1981 rather. Uh, and much of that district physically looks very much the same, but the general demographics and makeup of that city were changing, and they were changing in a way uh, that was uh, to a more racially diverse district. Uh, and now it's one of the most racially diverse districts in the city of Boston. I think, uh, I think we're either the first or the second in that regard. Um, but my father and my mother, uh, Felix D'Arroyo, who's here today, uh, and you know, I think I'm the third here to stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, my father and my mother were, I think, like the fifth family uh, to move into High Park, uh, and, and uh, a fan, fifth family of color, uh, and that came with it some some interesting things growing up and seeing I had a neighbor because uh, my city my father worked for the city of Boston prior to being an elected official uh, he once had to bring the city of Boston car home uh, and I remember we had a neighbor who called the police because they assumed that it was stolen uh, and so there were things like this uh, you know we used to have this big three kings uh, celebration uh, and, and rest in peace to uh, Mickey uh, Roach uh, he was the police commissioner at the time and my father's and mother's Three King celebration would have a crowd, which was really interesting when you're growing up as a kid. Uh, we grew up pretty solidly uh, middle class. Um, and, you know, once a year I would like have the mayor in my living room. That was very strange. Uh, but you had a situation once where the police were called and we had Mickey Roach, the police commissioner, answer the door, right? So uh, there were these interesting sort of microaggressions that existed in my district and my neighborhood always felt like my neighborhood. I played youth sports. Uh, High Park, thankfully, is one of those places where you could still walk to uh, youth sports. I used to walk to all of the fields. Uh, so, you know, like we're talking about 15, 20, 25 minute walks to these fields um, to play sports. And you, I always felt like I was part of High Park, but uh, it wasn't until much later in my life that I started to see High Park uh, as leadership reflected uh, in me. And so very grateful to be uh, the first elected person of color to represent District 5. Uh, I understood and continue to understand uh, the responsibility of that. And I'm grateful that I'm not the last uh, person of color who will represent District 5. Uh, I want to take a moment to just thank my family who's here. Uh, former Councillor Felix D. Arroyo, my father. Former Councillor Felix G. Arroyo, my, my brother. Uh, and my other brother, uh, Ernesto Iraq Arroyo, is, is here, uh, and I'm grateful to them. Uh, this has been uh, difficult, and uh, 
to be clear, you know, I walked into politics eyes wide open. I, my father growing up uh, used to have to read the Herald where Howie Carr would uh, call him subtitles uh, because he speaks with an accent. Uh, and so seeing sort of that and growing up with that understanding that running for and being in office often makes you a target, especially if you fight on behalf of folks who often aren't allowed into these rooms to begin with or weren't allowed into these rooms. In fact, with laws and times to not allow folks into these rooms. When you have these kinds of changes and generational changes, sometimes uh, the uh, approach can be rocky. And it was his image uh, and his courage uh, and his belief that he belonged in every single room uh, in which decisions were made for his community that really motivated me to run. Uh, it was my mother's love of service, uh, Elsa Montano, who was, a, who was for 35 years a teacher here in Boston Public Schools, uh, who both worked uh, full time and raised us full time. And I still don't know how she found the time to do all of that. Uh, a lovely, wonderful person who uh, has been dealing with health issues and isn't here. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank my brothers for their examples uh, and for the support, uh, unwavering support that they've given me in the work that I do. Uh, you know, every person who stood up here uh, has had a good article written about them and a bad article written about them. Uh, and uh, I can speak for myself. I don't get on the highs and I don't get on the lows. Um, you know, if you, if you overindulge in the adulation, then you have to overindulge in the jeering. Uh, and so I try to not indulge in either. Uh, but your family members read that and see that and, and feel that and they carry uh, the weight of that. And so I want to acknowledge Jennifer Calcano, who is my partner, but uh, today was too difficult of a day uh, for her to be here. Uh, and you know, I want to acknowledge uh, that it's been difficult for family as well uh, to see someone that they love uh, sort of have to go through and, and deal with certain things. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, I'm very grateful, uh, incredibly grateful for folks on this council uh, who have taken time at difficult parts of the last two to four years to check in, to say, hey, I saw this happen, uh, care about you. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, I want to take a moment to show grace uh, to those who took that opportunity to uh, pile on or to push them further uh, and just acknowledge that, you know, you can have that duality on a body uh, and still have civility and still have the ability to move work forward. Uh, it hasn't always been, you know, roses and it hasn't always been thorns. Uh, and so I, I just want to take a moment to just acknowledge the, the council colleagues who I've had who have helped advance work uh, where we meet. Uh, that's, that's been important. Um, I also just want to acknowledge sort of why I even did this, <laughs> why I run for office, why I put yourself through all this. Uh, you know, systematically, this city has been changing. Uh, and I think for the most part, I think demonstrably changing for the better. I think there's issues of affordability, issues of people being priced out of their neighborhoods that they've grown up in and that they love uh, that you could argue has certainly not gotten better. And I hope that we address that moving forward. But I think uh, ever more we move towards racial justice in a city where uh, people of color have equal opportunities uh, and equal chances uh, to succeed, where uh, they see themselves reflected in leadership and in city government uh, and where services are equally distributed uh, to neighborhoods like Mattapan, like High Park, like Rosendale, and to other sort of residential neighborhoods uh, that often did not receive the bulk of or that support. And I like to think that the work that we move forward uh, was always grounded in racial and economic justice. Uh, and that's the one common theme through all of the things, uh, just justice in general, through all of the things that my office has been able to push forward. Uh, and so I'm grateful to uh, my communities for electing me and believing in that message and for my colleagues for helping get those things done. It takes uh, at a minimum seven votes. And so I'm grateful to all of you for that. Uh, I want to also take a moment uh, to thank my staff. Uh, I've had a very tight staff, very uh, close-knit staff. We came in uh, right when the pandemic started. So I had about a month, uh, me, Councillor Braden, uh, Councillor Mejia, we had about a month in our offices before everything was in lockdown. Uh, and every, the way of which you sort of manage an office completely changed. Um, and you know, we were talking about a life-changing crisis uh, where people we knew and cared for were dying, where things required sort of instant response. Uh, and in that framework, we became very close. And so I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who's ever worked for me. I'm going to go through this list. 
uh, Hank Cohen uh, and Michelle Pierre Vermont, who were uh, my earliest constituent services directors, uh, my two chiefs of staffs, uh, Caitlin Fleischman, uh, who was followed by Jordan Frias, who's been uh, really uh, couldn't do nearly any of the things I do. Jordan Frias wasn't my chief of staff and allowed me uh, the peace of mind of knowing that something that needed to get done would get done if an individual called uh, with a specific constituent service need, finding a way to get that need serviced or finding a way to get uh, a request for, hey, you know, last minute, we're, we're literally in a hearing, I, I, I need five minutes and I need this data point within 10, uh, getting it within that time frame. Uh, so I want to thank Jordan Frias for really holding things together. Uh, my former directors of policy budget, uh, research and budget, uh, Yasmin Radasi, uh, who's now over at the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency, uh, Farouk Sabadin, who I see over there in the corner, thank you for what you do. Uh, currently working for Ed Markey as the regional director, Cecily Graham, who is now uh, ONS for High Park. Uh, all great former directors of policy and research and budget. Uh, everything that I ever passed, everything that I ever moved, uh, touched one of their hands, multiple of their hands, uh, and was made better for it. Uh, my directors of constituent services, Janice uh, Guillet, who's over at uh, Guillet, who's over with uh, 311 now. Uh, she was so good, 311 stole her from me. Uh, Justin Gardner, Jamie Levesque, uh, my directors of operations uh, who really helped manage uh, the day-to-day -day operations in my office, uh, Greg Molina, uh, J.D. Linatis, uh, Roman Colon, who serves the distinction of also being uh, the former uh, Boston municipal officer who saved my father's life, so uh, very grateful to him for multiple reasons, uh, and my part-time staff, uh, Skasha Charles and Sean Irby. Uh, and so, you know, if I leave you with, with anything, it's, uh, you know, measure what you do here by the impact that it has. Uh, you never know how long you have to serve. When you're serving, it is a privilege. Uh, and uh, my day-to-day -day mode of operation was largely to measure what the level of impact any vote or any legislation or anything I was passing had, and then based on how much impact I believe it had, dedicating uh, a, a correct amount of sort of resources and personal time towards that. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of great work ahead of all of you. I wish you all success uh, in meeting those moments. Uh, and uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity I've served and grateful for the example uh, that was provided to me by my parents and, and by my family uh, in that work. So thank you very much. Love you, Jenny. I'm sure you're probably watching this on YouTube. Uh, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, Council Royal. I also want to recognize Council Lara if you'd like to speak from the podium. Council Lara. <laughs> thank you, President Flynn, and thank you so much, um, all of you. I brought the napkins with me because I'm already emotional. <laughs> um, I also didn't prepare any remarks, mostly because I want to be, uh, I want to keep it short and sweet. <laughs> I hope to at least keep it short and sweet. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for, you know, all of the support that you've given me. Um, I often tell the story about my first time in the chambers. I was in the sixth grade, I was 13. And I was at a protest outside of the Ayanela Chambers. And we were protesting for uh, rent control. I was but four, four feet tall, small, sixth grader. I knew what was happening, but um, I was here with City Life. My, my, one of my close friend's mother was a volunteer with City Life and she brought us. She was like, we're gonna go here, we're gonna come to this thing. And so the first time that I stepped foot in the Ayanela Chambers was not as an elected official. I was very young. And it set me on a path to fight. It set me on a path to fight for not just myself, but for my community and for my people and for the people that I didn't often see represented here. And much like a lot of your counselors, um, that started with my parents. I grew up in a household where um, with two immigrant parents 
my multiple, you know, my mother came into this country uh, undocumented. She she came to the U.S. I came across the Mexican border not once, not twice, but three times. Um, and her driver was her children. She wanted us to have a better life than she did in the Dominican Republic. And I grew up in a home where everything that my mother did was for people in our community, was for our family. My sister tells, my older sister tells a story of how my mother bumped into this old man in the Dominican Republic who didn't remember who he was or maybe was, you know, was having a mental health um, crisis and he was sitting on the ground. And my older sister tells the story about how my mother brought this stranger home and gave her bed up for him and how they slept on the floor that night because my mother gave her bed to this older man and then spent the whole next day finding his family in our neighborhood. Now it's a you know, small neighborhood in the Dominican Republic and so that didn't necessarily take long, but I come from a family that um, saw injustice and saw people struggling and really decided to do something about it. And so that is a lot of what I carry here as an elected official. When I decided to run for office, it was not of my own volition. <laughs> um, unlike Councilor Arroyo, I, I definitely didn't have a, a background in this and it's not something that I would have chosen for myself. And I don't know that it's something that I would choose for myself again, to be honest. Um, but the people in my community and in my district saw injustice. They saw people struggling and they felt like the voices of their beliefs and their values were not being represented. And they asked me to, to run. And there was a big coalition of people who got organized and they said, please. And so running for public office for me was an act of service. It was a reluctant <laughs> act of service. Um, and it has been the greatest honor of my life to serve my district. Um, to be the first person of color to represent my district, to be the first black woman to represent my district. And what a two years um, it has been. The amount of work that we were able to get done for our constituents, for black and brown people, for people who are struggling, for parents, for working people, unprecedented, more than I could have ever imagined we could have gotten done, whether it be removing homes in East Boston from the speculative market, ensuring that we're gonna have affordable housing, changing the inclusionary development policy, securing money for youth jobs, those were things that felt unreachable to people in my community. And I am incredibly honored and just humbled that we were able to get that done here and so much more while I was on the council. And so I wanna take this moment to really say thank you to my constituents in District 6 for giving me the honor of serving you for the last two years. I would have not been able to get it done if it wasn't for um, you, all of the community organizations, all of the groups that are on the ground. Everything that I do was for you. It was with you behind me. It was with your push. It was with your blessing. It was with your wisdom um, that I came here as a steward and a representative of a vision that was not mine, but had been coming to be for generations before me. And so I am incredibly grateful and indebted to you for, for all of that. Like most people here, I wouldn't be able to do this without my staff. Um, Alex Ponte Capellan, who came from City Life to be my chief of staff. Nora McMahon and Vincent, who served as my director of constituent services for West Roxbury and is you know, not here. Clara Goldberg, um, my, my fiery Leo queen from West Roxbury, who did all of our policy and, and research. And Sean Waddington, who served um, and did the same uh, after Clara left us. And of course, my three brothers here. We have a joke in our office. We jokingly call our office the Office of Black Male Advancement. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a title that I carry with pride. We have Lee Nave Jr. Please stand up. Come on. Michael McMillan and BJ Oswagi.
A lot of my life um, started um, by serving young people. I'm a career youth worker, I was a street worker, I worked with young black men uh, most of my life. And so when I came into office, I was just beaming with pride to be able to have these three um, young black men working for me. And they have become my family. I mean, you know, Lee, thank you for saying yes <laughs> to coming back here. <laughs> um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it without you. Just if, if it was making sure that I ate, that I had something to drink, asking me questions, managing my schedule, uh, everything, absolutely, like these young men are my entire spine, my backbone. I couldn't function without them and I'm entirely grateful. Michael, you are not just my friend, but you know, an incredible, incredible support. That's why everybody in the district loves you because you are a people's person. And I am internally grateful for you, for the way that you became a big brother to Zaire. You saw that little boy and you just <laughs> took over. And I wouldn't be able, as a single mother, to be um, in this position if it wasn't for your absolute love and care <laughs> of that little boy. BJ, my brother, we've been in the trenches <laughs> for the past three months, thank you. Thank you for saying yes to coming to my office. Thank you for all of your commitment. Thank you for saying yes to serving West Roxbury, a neighborhood that was unfamiliar to you, people that were unfamiliar to you, a community that wasn't yours, and for doing it with grace and love and patience. They are so lucky to have you, and I am so lucky to have you. And for being my interim chief of staff for the past three months, uh, we wouldn't be able to finish off how we're finishing right now if it wasn't for you. I am just, I'm indebted to you. And wherever you end up, they will be lucky to have you. And I am happy to be one, one stop um, for you. Um, there's so much more to say. There's, you know, like, there's not, not anything else that I can say to really encapsulate all of the last two years. Obviously, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Anderson, Councilor Mejia, thank you. Um, there's nothing, I can't say anything else, but thank you. Um, I want to end off by saying that there are people that came before me, Councilor Arroyo here, who for a long time when I was a youth organizer was one of the only people who was speaking for us here on the council, set that example for us. Felix for being a big brother, Iraq for being a big brother to me. Um, the people who came before us had to navigate a lot of different challenges to be able to um, serve in public office. And I have to navigate a lot of different challenges to serve in public office, but I think for me, one of the most present challenges was being a single parent, being able to, to make the meetings, bringing my son to the city council, Councilor Anderson, who at a drop of a dime would get in her car and babysit Zaire until 9 p.m. so that I could go to events. Counselor Mejia <laughs> would find a niece <laughs> to help babysit um, the chairs of the committees who so graciously would let me bring my very loud <laughs> seven-year-old to the chambers so that I could work and to my constituents in District 6 who let me serve and parent at the same time. Thank you. I. I hope that what we were able to do is an example of what you can do when you have community and backing. And I hope my request and, and my hope is that it calls on us to be more committed to make sure that these seats are accessible to more people in the future. That they're accessible to single parents, that they're accessible to younger folks, that they're accessible to people who are poor, who are working, that we make it so that being an elected official is not such a difficult and daunting task on your family and on your spirit. So thank you um, to all of my council colleagues who have worked on so many different things with me. Um, 
you have been a bomb at different moments, Frank. My, my, unlikely, my unlikely friend here on the council um, who, during one of my most difficult moments, make sure that you called. Thank you. So, I'm sorry to be so emotional, <laughs> but thank you. We did, uh, we had a hell of a run. We did an incredible amount of work onward and um, thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. We will continue with memorials. Today we're going to adjourn this meeting. to adjourn this meeting in memory of the following for City Council of Coletta, Clara, Elise, Leslie, Ian, Seaman, Paul Izuzu Jr., Karen Marie Pollock, Carol Scalia, for City Councilor Laura, Maria, Australia, Vasquez, For City Councilor Louis Jean, Guy Targetti, Kamala D. Constant. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. And before we do adjourn, we do have gifts for the four departing members, I, I would ask all four councillors to come back up with my colleagues and we'll present these gifts and take a photo if that's okay. And if my colleagues can join us for a photo. I would also, while we're gathering for a photo, I would like to recognize my neighbor in South Boston, State Senator Nick Collins. Thank you, Senator Collins, for being here. And again, I, I do want to recognize former city councilor and state legislator Rob Consalvo as well. And Issa Asabi George, it's good to be with you, councilor, and both, both Arroyo's councilor, Arroyo, Felix Arroyo, and councilor Arroyo as well. I'm going to get down from the podium. <laughs> Thank you for being our president for the last two years. The chair moves that when the council adjourned today, we do so in memory of those mentioned individuals. I do want to say thank you to the clerk, the assistant clerk, a wonderful court stenographer as well. Our Obviously, my colleagues on the city council, on the city council, their staff, 
the city council central staff as well. They've done a tremendous job and we're very proud of the city council central staff. You do a tremendous job. You support all of us equally. You're professional, you're honest, you have a lot of integrity. I want to say thank you again to the city council central staff. I want to say thank you as well to my city council staff as well for their professionalism, dedication to the residents of my district and to the city. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. The council is adjourned. Thank you.